Test, test, test. Please do not. Test, 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 test. Test, test, good. One, one, oh, five. Again, apologies. Uh, speaker uh, here at Elon Law. Again, these are talks designed not to be formal presentations or lectures, but rather interactive discussions of scholarship that's being conducted by uh, the faculty at Elon University. So it's uh, a lot of fun and uh, it's really exciting to bring over scholars from the main campus who uh, may not venture west as much as uh, we would like. Uh, and so that's part of uh, what the goal is. So today uh, we have with us Professor uh, Derek Blackcap, and I know I know I'm not revealing uh, any privacy uh, interest here by noting that uh, Professor Blackcap was recently uh, both promoted and tenured at Elon. Uh, so congratulations. On this Thanks. Uh, and, and we had planned that we would celebrate, right, both that promotion and tenure with this talk. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Professor Lackett is part of the communication and technology law group that exists at the university and will be chatting today all right, about Vikings, clowns, and pirates, an Icelandic saga of e-democracy. Again, I remind you, this is an opportunity for feedback and discussion of legal issues and not legal issues because Professor Lackett is not a lawyer and the people in this room either are or will be. So thank you for joining us today, Derek. Yep. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for convening the series and for Elon Law for uh, hosting this. Actually, I've been here six years and my first time in the Elon Law building, so uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I titled this talk An Icelandic Saga for a, for a specific reason. Uh, I'm not sure how you're familiar with medieval literature, uh, but the real Icelandic sagas were filled with these larger-than-life characters, uh, stories of uh, betrayal, tragedy, a lot of dark humor. Um, political maneuvering, and these unending cycles of uh, really bloody revenge. With the exception of the bloody revenge part, or maybe just with the exception of the uh, bloody part, that's really Icelandic history for the past uh, decade or so. Um, so uh, my approach here is maybe a little bit different in that uh, Dave, uh, Dr. Levine gave you uh, an example of some of the, the scholarship that I've done in this area. So maybe you've checked that out, maybe you haven't. I'm not going to talk specifically about that, but I want to take a step back and speak more broadly about what's actually been going on in Iceland and why I think it's so uh, interesting. So my overview, I guess, of what's, uh, what's going to happen here is that uh, there was a crisis in Iceland that provided a very unique context for lots of different types of new projects, lots of different types of uh, new innovations. And a lot of these have been uh, civic or political or policy uh, and legal uh, oriented projects. And so this is um, uh, just a really interesting, really unique context. An argument that I make uh, in the, the work that I do is that it's this context that allows us to understand why these things, these projects have actually worked. So there's a lot of people that are, are testing new projects and trying new, uh, new approaches to, uh, to politics, but in Iceland, a lot of things have stuck, and so that's, that's pretty interesting to me. So I'll do a kind of an overview of, of some of these interesting, what I think are interesting areas, and then maybe a little bit more of a focus on better Reykjavik, because that's the, the uh, area that I have the most expertise in. To orient you to my, uh, to my interest, I guess, so uh, one of my 
areas of research is uh, basically government and technology. So I'm fascinated by the ways that uh, new communication technologies have uh, are shifting the ways that governments relate to citizens, basically. Uh, because this field of study emerged in the 90s, we have a lot of uh, terms that start with E, kind of awkwardly. So we've got e-government, e-administration, e-democracy, e-participation, uh, and so on and so on. That doesn't matter too much. The trend that I think is interesting is that uh, originally e-government focus was focused on making government processes more efficient. So think about uh, going online to pay your water bill or to pay your taxes or to find out your property assessment. So this was a, uh, an early focus, I think, on technology and government. It's gotten much more interesting, I think, since we've started to move towards uh, e-democracy or e-participation. So we can now make an argument that, that maybe it's not just about making existing process more efficient, but maybe it's about uh, giving citizens more agency, giving them more opportunities, uh, trying new things, trying reconfiguring the, uh, the contract between the, uh, the citizen and the state. One of the interesting uh, contexts for this type of reconfiguration is, is often called policy crowdsourcing. This is a terrible, a terrible term because it's not really crowdsourcing. But what people are generally talking about in this area are somehow opening up the legislative process to citizens. So whether they can uh, propose new legislation or debate new legislation, uh, whatever that looks like. But that's, that's something that's going on a lot in the space. There's, there's a lot of uh, discussion of how this might work. And finally, one of the things that comes across uh, in my research, one of the things that tends to uh, make these types of projects fail or make them very difficult to implement is something that's been termed the middleman process, uh, paradox. And what this is essentially is that uh, there are people between the citizens and uh, and uh, the policy-making process called politicians who are not necessarily that enthusiastic about giving up their power, right? About ceding power to the, to the unwashed masses. So uh, I guess a big theme of uh, what I wanna talk about today is, is how what's happened in Iceland uh, avoids the middleman uh, uh, paradox because basically they, for a short period of time, they got rid of the middleman. I apologize, I'm going to have to plug in my uh, computer because I see it's just about dead. So like all good uh, stories, like all good sagas, uh, I've got a prologue and three acts. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it is, it is important because context, uh, context really matters in this, uh, in this case. Let's see if I can reach here. Sorry about that. Anybody been to Iceland? All right. Iceland, you know, it's, it's uh, the closest European country to the United States, but it's also not, uh, it's not very well connected. So people that go to Europe tend not to go to Iceland. You have to have a reason to go to Iceland. The reason that the original settlers went was to get away from uh, tyrannical kings. So uh, a bunch of Vikings and adventurers, uh, these Norse, uh, Norse folks, they took their Celtic slaves and went to this island that just had a few um, uh, monks living there, and they kicked the monks out and, and settled it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, exciting things, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of violence, a lot of sorting things out for a couple of hundred years, the, the Viking Age. Uh, but pretty soon, Iceland comes back under the control of the Norse, Norse kingdoms. It's kicked around between Sweden and Denmark and Norway over the next thousand years or so. Um, and after the sagas are written, so the early kind of medieval period after that, Iceland kind of falls off the map. It's dirt poor. Uh, nobody really wants to go there. Nobody really comes out of there. It's, uh, it's basically ignored for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's really World War II that changed the course of history for Iceland. Uh, while Denmark, which had it at the time, uh, was busy being occupied by Hitler. Uh, Iceland sent a note to Denmark saying, we declare independence. So in 1944, I think they declared independence, uh, became a, a sovereign nation. The Americans built a uh, air base during World War II uh, in Iceland. So suddenly Iceland becomes important geographically in the Cold War. And there's a lot of money, American money from the Marshall Plan, American money from uh, you know, soldiers on the base, 
suddenly Iceland is reconnected to the rest of the world. Um, and over the next few decades, they modernize their fishing fleets, they modernize their society. And so Iceland goes from being the poorest country in Europe uh, to being a modern developed country very, very quickly um, in ways that, that Europe, modern European countries um, uh, didn't see. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes from visiting was that as late as the 70s, there was a member of parliament who lived in a turf hut, a traditional turf hut in Iceland. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, uh, it's reasonable. So very, very quick development um, after the war. So Iceland is about the size of Kentucky, and the total population today is, is a little over 300,000. So it's about a Greensboro-sized nation state. It's a small state, right? They have uh, their own language. They have their own, uh, all their own government functions. It's just very small. So our first, uh, first part of the, the real story begins in 2001, when there is a uh, massive deregulation of uh, the financial industry. Um, and this does really good things for a while. This, this brings about this huge economic boom. And Iceland, uh, after making steady growth and development, you know, becoming a, a modern country, Iceland suddenly becomes the richest country in the world right, per capita. So uh, Iceland hits the tops of all those indices that you want to be at the top of. So they're the, the healthiest, the wealthiest, the richest people in the world. And this is when a lot of people started looking at Iceland because we seem to see a country that had it all. So if you were some uh, you know, bleeding heart lefty, you look at Iceland and you saw this great social welfare system and free education and uh, you know, the great hallmarks of the, the big welfare state. If you were a free market, uh, neoliberal type, you looked at this and you saw everybody's getting super rich, everybody's making lots of money, the business side of things is, is booming, it's awesome. So everybody looked at Iceland in the 2000s and said, it's amazing, everything's going right there. And that's the end of the first act. Because of course, uh, as was the case everywhere else in the world, this, this, uh, this boom had to go bust. Uh, the, it went bust around the world, right? This was the, uh, the global financial crisis. It hit Iceland particularly hard. Uh, by the end of 2000, you could tell that things were going badly. In 2008, you had th the three biggest banks fail in fairly quick succession. And so Iceland was talking about how to nationalize them. And uh, on October 6, 2008, this is the prime minister. He gives a televised address. It's about, I don't know, 10, 15 minute address. Where basically he says, uh, we're screwed. We, uh, we're going to implement some kind of uh, extraordinary new economic policies to try to staunch the flow of blood, uh, but basically we are done. The thing that concerned the Icelanders the most about this talk was he ended it with the words, God bless Iceland. You know, Iceland is a secular society, so actually them saying, God bless Iceland, was the most terrifying part of this entire announcement. This is an actual take from that, uh, from that talk that he gave on TV. This is the stock market. This crisis affected, real, affected Icelanders in a real way. It affected them personally. So, so this wasn't just something that happened to the financial elites. This was debt for everybody. This was massive unemployment, at least in uh, Icelandic terms. This was a real, real effect on people. And it made the Icelanders very, very angry. They threw uh, yogurt and eggs and milk at their parliament building. This tiny little building is parliament. It's adorable. Uh, and it came out that basically the entire elite of Iceland was somehow implicated in the collapse. So if you were involved in finance, if you were involved in politics, if you were involved in business, if you were involved in fishing even, right? this is a tiny country. Everybody kind of was connected to the problems that happened. So. Um, after the crisis, uh, there's no trust in the elites anymore, which opens up this opportunity for new players to get involved. And that's what, and that's what really happened. So we swept away everybody who had power, right? They got voted out, they got, uh, they got canned. The people really rose up and kicked everybody out. Leading to, you know, what I like in this, in this uh, headline, Icelanders are turning to some strange methods for reforming their government. Strange methods indeed. The projects that they started were, in a lot of ways, idiosyncratic. They were naive. They were things that um, wouldn't have been tried anywhere else, 
But the Icelanders didn't really care, right? There's like, we have nothing to lose. Uh, we're not necessarily professionals. We're just people that want to want to fix things. And so they did. And so a couple of things that they did, and this is where maybe it gets more interesting uh, from a, a legal perspective. One thing that happened was the creation of uh, an institution called the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, which was later renamed the International Modern Media Institute. What happened was Julian Assange and some WikiLeaks folks were in uh, Reykjavik for a uh, privacy and information security conference. They connected with a, an Icelandic MP named uh, Birgitta Jonsdotter, uh, and they catched this plan uh, to basically make Iceland a data haven. So kind of the opposite of a tax haven. They wanted to make it a data haven uh, where, with a strong focus on data privacy, uh, information privacy, free speech, things like that. And the way they did this was kind of interesting, was they looked around the world and they found the best ideas they could related to information privacy. And they took all these laws and they tried to bundle them together. So they took the best elements of, of uh, American free speech laws and Australian and European and pulled it all together. Birgitta uh, proposed this in the Icelandic parliament and it passed unanimously. Implementation has been, uh, has been uneven, but that's pretty interesting, right? What is So the things like uh, whistleblower protection and source protection went through pretty easily, but it turns out that within the, uh, the Icelandic system, all of these things had to go through different committees and departments and bills. So a lot of things have been kind of hung up. So I know uh, like virtual limited liability companies is something they're enthusiastic about. That hasn't happened yet. Um, they, there was an interesting case a couple of years ago where they, uh, the Icelandic registrar, so the, the, the organization that runs the .is domain name, they took down a, an ISIS uh, website that was hosted there, you know, kind of potentially undermining uh, some, of these, uh, some of these free speech issues. So there was, there's a huge amount of will here, but uh, implementation has been, has been uneven, I'd say. There's also the crowdsource constitution. This was probably the, the issue that got the most, um, most international attention. They, this was framed as a crowdsource constitution. It wasn't really, but it did have some interesting elements. The format was basically they uh, got together a whole bunch of people in, the, uh, in a room. I hope they cho chose names out of a phone book, brought together a thousand people. And they, this group, over the course of a day, established the bounds of the Constitution. So what was the Constitution going to focus on? So that was kind of neat. Rather than getting a bunch of lawyers to write the Constitution, they had a national election. 540 people stood for election to be on the Constitutional Council. They elected 25 people, uh, journalists, academics, farmers, um, you know, more or less ordinary folk. And these were the people that actually drafted the Constitution. And then they did post their drafts and receive feedback on Facebook. So this is a Facebook page. The discussions, debates were conducted in English. Uh, and uh, they did. So you could, anybody in the world could actually go in and suggest changes or suggest ideas. Uh, and a lot of these suggestions and ideas, this debate contributed directly to the development of the document. So the final document uh, was produced. It was approved by a plebiscite, and then through some uh, opponents of the new constitution were able to kill it in parliament. So it didn't actually work out. They don't actually have a new constitution. They still have their old one. And then finally, we've got um, these guys. This is uh, Robert Bjarnason and Gunnar Grimson, uh, who are self-taught uh, self web developers. They created a platform called Better Reykjavik. And Better Reykjavik is the, the focus of the, a lot of my research. It's what I've spent the most time on. The paper that, um, uh, that uh, was distributed really focuses on the city's per perception of this site. Um, but there's also kind of a brief technical overview of it. Uh, what was the other link? 
The gist of it is, is that Better Reykjavik is an online platform that allows for crowdsourcing. So basically you can submit new ideas for city policies. You can debate those ideas. So it provides a venue for deliberation of new policies. And it allows you to petition the government with these ideas. So these, there are a, a process in place so it means that that the most uh, well-received ideas, publicly well-received well ideas, have to be taken up by the city council. It's been a normalized, and by normalized I mean it's, it's just there, it's not like uh, uh, a special event, it's not for special types of policies, it's just always there for people to contribute to since 2011. They've got about 11,000 users, there's been 2,000 policy proposals that have gone through. And through this all, the, the whole thing, it's been autonomously developed. So this is not a city project. This is an independent nonprofit organization that runs this thing and the city uniquely says, we're gonna work with you. We're gonna take, take on the ideas that come out of this. So those are the things that are most interesting for me about Better Reykjavik. This is what uh, the interface looks like. I'm not sure if you can see, how's your Icelandic? Okay. Here's, a, here's a, an individual proposal. The debate deliberation occurs underneath. So you can post uh, in favor or against. You can write in favor or against an individual idea. And then these, these uh, points for or against are also kind of ranked and, uh, and debated. But again, it's been... Can I ask a question about that? Or do you speak Icelandic enough? Okay. No. So maybe ask a question. <laughs> Uh, where you had the, I, I see your name at the top, so you yes. have to log in. Yes. So it's not, a, you're not giving anonymous. No. Feedback. Okay. No. So that's that's part of the transparency. So a lot of these, uh, a lot of these kind of socio-technical types of projects are explicitly against anonymity. So they they want everybody on record. They want everybody. Uh, you want it to be clear who's who's moving ideas and proposing ideas because they there's a sense that there's a lack of transparency that led to some of the shenanigans of the pre-crisis days. This uh, Better Reykjavik project is interesting uh, from a technical point of view, I guess, or a, a socio-technical point of view because it's been so iterative. So it's open source. So if you want to, you can uh, you can download this and you can run this. Uh, the software yourself, but it wasn't. There was no like ten month planning period. It wasn't the city council that said we're going to do this. We're going to plan it out. It's just these guys that just built it and started using it. And so it was a very, a very grassroots oriented um, type of project. And it was iterated over the years. They they threw something out there, really cheap, really fast, open source. Saw what worked. Then they'd revise it, launch it again. Then they revise it, launch it again, and revise it, launch it, launch it again. So the final iteration, this Better Reykjavik, is actually uh, four or five versions of this project down the road. The specific reason that uh, the Better Reykjavik could work is this guy, for the most part. Uh, Jon Gnar is an Icelandic uh, comedian and uh, actor. He decided to run for mayor of Reykjavik as a joke. They, he got together. Uh, uh, some of his friends, uh, musician friends, artist friends, and uh, put together a campaign video. It was basically a parody video of uh, Tina Turner's We Are the Best. It was really funny. It went viral. Uh, and then all of a sudden, he was polling way higher than any of the other actual candidates. So we decided to really, yeah. <laughs> so he decided to run for real. And he put together a campaign. And the campaign was things like bring a Disneyland to Iceland. Uh, put free towels in the public pools, uh, get a polar bear in the zoo. Um, so like nonsense, right? And this didn't hurt his, it didn't hurt his campaign at all. Again, maybe we have some echoes of, of this today. But he did eventually decide to be a serious candidate. And if you want to be a serious candidate, you have to have a policy platform. And one of the things that he did was he invited Gunnar and Robert to run Better Reykjavik to generate a policy platform. You know, he, he, he wanted to know what this, the citizens' real ideas were, what the real policy priorities were. So in the first instance, he used that to build the planks of his campaign. And then after he became mayor and after the city was running, they revamped the site to just make it a regular, uh, a regular channel for citizen interaction. 
And the reasons they wanted to do this, this is Young Gunnar again. One of the first things that he did was he, he created a holiday called Good Day Day. And it's a day where everybody says good day to each other. And this was the video that he announced. Anyway, this, from the city's perspective, they wanted to increase trust. So they wanted the, the citizens to see that the city was actually responsive uh, to their needs, that they were actually um, uh, working on behalf of the citizens. They wanted to increase inclusivity. So they wanted to bring more people into the process, not just the people that would show up at uh, particular meetings, but people that were uh, maybe, maybe uh, not as well, well connected to the process. And finally, they wanted to increase civic understanding. It's tough work to run a city. One thing that citizens don't often understand is, is how all the, the priorities might compete against each other, how all these things are um, uh, you know, competing for time and attention and money and how decisions are made. And so what they saw with Better Reykjavik was a, was a chance to open that up. So to get those committee responses, to get people understanding why their particular ideas that they think are fantastic uh, are not the only ideas that people think are fantastic. Final act is basically the last couple of years, uh, some interesting things happened. April 2013, Icelanders had another parliamentary election. They reelected the parties that were in charge when the crash happened, uh, and a couple of pirates. In May 2014, the best party disbanded. Jung Gnar decided not to run for office again. Uh, and a new, uh, a new government, city government came in. But this is one of the interesting things. The new government decided to retain the Better Reykjavik project. So it survived this transition. I think that's something that's also novel. That hasn't happened before. They even, the new government even created a new administration and democracy standing committee designed to kind of increase the influence of these types of projects. They wanted to, uh, to bring in more of these types of uh, initiatives. Uh, and Better Reykjavik remains part of the new normal. And then you might have seen something about this uh, in the news. For the past year or so, the Pirate Party, the Icelandic Pirate Party, which currently has three members of uh, parliament, in Iceland, has been over 30% in the polls. A couple of weeks ago, it was 40% in the polls, which is more than the ruling coalition combined. Uh, if there was election today, the pirates would run Denmark by themselves without a coalition. So there's interesting things, uh, interesting things going on in Iceland. The short answer to why is because the crisis hit people very hard. It opened this, uh, this window for new strange, uh, idiosyncratic types of projects. And a lot of them are sticking, right? A lot of them are, uh, are having these long-term interesting, interesting effects. Better Reykjavik in particular is, is interesting because it's, it's the only project of its kind that's lasted this long. People have launched things like this that have uh, uh, you know, lasted a few months or they lasted a few weeks or they've been for special events. But Better Reykjavik is now part of the Reykjavik city government. Which is, which is interesting. It also shows how something like this can work. There's not going to be another context where you have everybody in power kind of wiped away and somebody like Jon Gnar becomes mayor. But there are things that we, can, that we can learn from it, that we can take from it. So that is a whirlwind overview of the things that I think are interesting that are going on in, uh, in Iceland. It took 24 minutes, so it was a little longer than I anticipated. But I'd be happy to kind of go back and uh, maybe highlight some of these things. Again, I wasn't sure what you would be interested in, but I wanted to give a big picture overview. So I'd be happy to do that. This will be your eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for the talk. It's really interesting. It's also interesting to kind of think about it relative to what we're experiencing in North Carolina now, where Sounds like they're using technology more and more for participatory government. I don't know, do, do they actually allow voting via cell phone? Or do you have to still show up in person and vote? And I think about it relative to our voting laws here in North Carolina, which are becoming more restrictive rather than more participatory. Yeah, in some ways. So, so not for general types of elections. But one thing that has happened that's interesting is the Better Reykjavik Project kind of spun out a participatory budgeting project, you know, kind of like you have one here. Uh, and you can go on there and vote online. So, so the priorities 
are kind of allocated in this way, what people want, how people want to spend this fraction of the city's budget, they're allocated that way, but then they actually get to commit that based on these votes, and they, and they do do that. And, I mean, what's always a concern in that sort of distance participation is fraud, right? I mean, that's the underlying yeah. basis for the laws that we have that in North Carolina that you part of the vote. Is, is there any concern of that in Iceland or, you know, not? Uh, is there any empirical data about fraud and maybe the stakes involved in this sort of thing where you can do this remote voting are, are low enough, you know, it's not electing official, like mine's important, but it's a little bit different than the biggest yeah, so so yes, that's a really good question. The biggest difference between the Icelandic context and actually a lot of European contexts and the US is that you can have a secure digital identity. So it's not that in Iceland that they're logging in with their email or they created a user account or anything like that. But there is a central government administrated database that allows them to log into their bank, that allows them to get their government services, that allows them to, to, uh, to verify they are who they are. And so that's the only way that the electronic voting can work. And that's why we will probably never have electronic voting in the US, because we will never have a centralized um, identity verification. We're just, it's, uh, there's a lot of people that are very opposed to, you know, having that centralization. But, but in, in Iceland, it's, I mean, it's, again, in a lot of, uh, a lot of European countries, there's not that concern about, about that. And so that's why you can do a vote with, with that too many issues. Yeah. Um, this is very fascinating, but uh, so the better pick is a uh, is a city scale. Um, you can trace that to try and do this on a national level. Things like regulations.gov, where people can make comments on proposed regulations, as well as the White House's petition uh, initiative, where if you get X number of petitions, the government will explain why we can't build a star. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a better Iceland, using the same platform. Uh, which provides an interesting contrast to Better Reykjavik. It was launched in the same way with, uh, with official support. But the key aspect, I think, uh, differentiates Better Iceland, which you can go and visit uh, online, it's still up, but it's had very little participation versus Better Reykjavik, is there isn't that, um, there isn't that direct connection between participation and, and outcomes. The way that Better Reykjavik did it was the city, uh, they didn't change any particular policies or any particular um, laws, but what they did was they instituted a policy that said, we will take the top 20 ideas that come through Better Reykjavik every month based on these different categories. So, you know, the top, uh, you know, city zoning issue and the top environmental issue and the top transportation issue, something like that. We'll take the top issues and we'll allocate them to the, the correct subcommittees of the government and put them on the agenda. So they're definitely on the agenda. And then we'll come back with the results of that committee discussion and post that publicly. So for every single idea that's come through that's been discussed, there's a paragraph or a page of either why this is a good idea that can be implemented, usually if it's not too expensive, or this is an idea that we'll have to uh, push off till we have uh, you know, more flexibility in the budget, or this is something that we can never do because it's terrible and illegal. The better Iceland version doesn't have that. It doesn't have that. It's more like, you know, if a politician wanted to see what the people thought, they could go in and check it out. And so I think that's, that's a key, uh, key aspect of the success here and the, success, and the failure of, of, of other types of projects. Because uh, this has been termed participation theater, right? If I'm, just, if I'm just engaging for fun or I'm engaging to, um, to learn more, I'm not really changing anything. And so I don't have a, necessarily a huge incentive to do it. So, okay, I'll click on the, you know, the We the People petition and you know, hopefully that contribute my name. But I'm not really gonna engage, I'm not really gonna deliberate, I'm not really gonna participate uh, unless I think, you know, as a citizen, it's gonna have a real impact. So, do you think that is that iterative process? Because if you go on regulations.gov, the, the administrative agency has to respond to what you said, but you know, how much there isn't a back and forth. Yeah. Same okay. Is that what you're, you're yeah, yeah. To keep? And just kind of as a demographics, is better record that for all intents and purposes better Iceland or a <laughs> So yeah, good. There's um there are so the greater Reykjavik area is about two hundred thousand people. That's two thirds so, so two so two thirds of the country is there. So that's that could also be part of it. Yeah. These is here, please feel free to grab. Uh, yes, not there. Uh, <laughs> let me 
Iceland's history with it, as you as you describe it, is is fascinating. I guess my I guess my, I have a comment, which is how much it would seem to me that, that pursuing this, and I'll make this question long so people can get that. Started, <laughs> um, how much of what is driving the current reaction to repeated problems that you describe, right? A function of identity, right? Because uh, you, you, you describe a nation that is the size of Greensboro, right? It's an island nation. Um, I, I'm not certainly well versed in Iceland's history, but there's been tension as to is it a part of Europe or is it something else? And there's a lot of identity politics nope. here. And so it's then reason that Iceland would seek to distinguish itself in a way that would draw people to it and not just as a flyover country that Iceland Air uses to try to get people yes. to stop and rank it. So the question is, right, and I did make this a little bit longer, um, how much of what is driving this, in your opinion, from a legal perspective, is driven by issues like branding and identity? And does that, if that's the case, explain why the population decided to keep these avant-garde e-democracy concepts that you would otherwise would imagine people would say, well, that didn't work. Let's throw that away, too. Identity is a big part of it. Um, so again, this was an identity here uh, that the Icelanders really kind of enjoyed, right? That they, they really enjoyed being you know, the smartest, healthiest, happiest, richest people. That's, that's, that's a kind of a good identity. Um, so what happened when it turned out that that wasn't really the case was that it was kind of a national identity crisis, you know, in a very real sense. And so there was, there was all this kind of national soul searching, and there was a real return to uh, an interest in traditional conservative values. And all of a sudden, everyone was wearing those uh, Icelandic jumpers again, you know, with the zigzag patterns. Like everybody was, you know, interested in being very traditional. And then also, one thing that I didn't mention was that uh, so there was this national assembly prior to the constitutional council process to, to define that. One of the other things that happened right off the bat was there was, that was actually the second National Assembly. And the first National Assembly um, was an attempt to define the, uh, define the goals of the country. Actually, let me see, I might be able to uh, show you this. Sorry, I talk about this in one of my classes too. Oh no, this is the same one. But anyway, this this idea that that uh, the, a priority of the country was to redefine its values, to redefine its identity and who it was. And so, this first national uh, first national uh, gathering brought together 1,200 people in this aircraft hangar for this day long. It was really interestingly organized, kind of like a focus group. Um, deliberation session, and out of these 1,200 people sitting at round tables, they established this document of what the national identity was. And so they was prioritizing, that's where we got uh, things like um, democracy, things like human rights, things like environmental protection, things like transparency. That's where they, you know, the Icelanders collectively decided this is the identity that we want to have. And so what I see is a lot of these projects is trying to, trying to build on that sense of of identity, so so I am MI, but also everything else, and I also see that as uh, you know part of the the appeal of the pirate party is like this is an identity that's uh, you know that maybe we can get behind, you know that differentiates us. Yeah. Do you think that especially as the younger generation that's, that's very social media focused and conscious, especially as they get into positions of governmental power, particularly at the local governmental level where there's more flexibility potential in terms of uh, structure and process that, that we can see these type of things here in the United States? Hopefully. I think that one of the reasons we haven't seen uh, successful projects like this in the United States so far is I think that most of the projects have been too big in scale. So the Obama administration came in with this open government directive and, and several projects 
um, you know, in 2008, where they wanted to, uh, they wanted to, to implement these types of things, I think. It doesn't work, it doesn't seem to work on a national scale, at least on a, a national scale as big as, as big as the U.S. So I think, yeah, so if, if there are cities that, um, you know, that attract, to attract these types of people into public service. And you've also got you know, groups like Code for America, right, that are attempting to, to insert these ideas and insert these capabilities into, into local government, then, then yes. Um, but it is, it is a different, uh, the political culture is very different, right? It's, it's, much more, it's much more polarized in the United States. And so it's much more, Iceland has kind of a consensus-based deliberation strategy, right? It's a culture of, of uh, mutual respect, you know, more or less. Uh, and there's room for a, a spectrum of opinions. And uh, in the US, American projects have tended to uh, become very, uh, very partisan very quickly in ways that the, the technologists don't anticipate, which has led to some challenges. What kind of media marketplace is there in Iceland? There are a handful of daily and uh, and uh, weekly newspapers. There are uh, several uh, four or five uh, TV stations. Um, lots of radio. So one of the things that impresses me about Iceland is just kind of mind blowing. Is that, yeah, this is like this is like Greensboro, but they have a robust a robust media market. They're, they're I love going to, uh, there's a bookstore uh, called uh, Amundsen, I think, that's basically a Barnes & Noble, uh, like three stories in downtown Reykjavik that's filled with Icelandic literature. There's only one, like, one little section of international literature. And walking in there, it's amazing because you think this, this would be like uh, a Barnes & Noble in Greensboro being filled with just Greensboro literature. So the, it's, very, it's a very literate, uh, literacy is very highly valued. Everybody still reads a newspaper, um, and there's a pretty, a pretty robust media market. Uh, is it privately owned or? Yep. TV stations and radio. Yeah. Sub subsidized, but but private. Yeah. It all seems uh, hard to transfer lessons from other places, cultures to the U.S. I mean, you know. You go to Singapore, you look at their educational system, you say, oh, the U.S. should have a similar educational system to Singapore, so good, but just the cultural differences are really hard, and, uh, and demographic differences, and, you know, like you were talking about consensus-based decision-making versus polarized, you know, conflict, basically. Yeah. And I'm just curious, like, um, I, I don't know the statistic for the U.S. Uh, or, or locally here in Greensboro, but I bet you that, like, our participation rate in government as far as voting, in local elections, probably less than 50%, right? Is it similar there? Is, are they- Off and on. Are they more engaged? I mean, I imagine like the, um, you know, when the crisis was going on, did they have a vote about whether to repay the debt or- the, uh, Yeah, there's a referendum. Ignore the debt that, you know, that yeah. they were gonna owe. I would assume that would have been a very high participation rate, but just kind of generally speaking, are they more, engaged politically. I mean, all these things you're talking about are attempts to kind of address the perceived problem of a lack of participation in government. But I wonder, is their problem really what we would see as like, oh, that'd be great if we had you know, the participation rate that they have? It's, it's generally, generally higher. I mean, in terms of just voting, it's generally a little bit higher than the US. But there are even things like, so there was a, a referendum on uh, the new constitution. And I'm pretty sure that less than half of Icelanders actually voted in that election, uh, which was interesting. That's but but not the crowdsourced constitution. Yeah, the crowdsourced constitution. Yeah. Um, right after the right after the crisis, participation was very high, and then it's kind of gone down. The 2013 election. So the economic recovery really started in about 2011. So it was a couple of years of of uh, despair, but then things kind of bounced back. Um, for various reasons, starting in 2011. And uh, you know, a lot of people said by 2013, things were back on track, and that's why they brought the old parties um, back in. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And it's, I think, not totally out of, it's not like a, 
99% participation rate for voting. It's, it's more in line with other advanced democracies. But again, I think, I think crisis pushes a little bit more uh, engagement in some types of ways. How well can law, in your opinion, drive identity? Hmm. Can you give me an example? Well, I mean, you know, it's the solution to the problem of Iceland's crisis is to find right a regulatory framework, right? Like you mentioned, right? The, the you know, which and Iceland is known for that, by the way. I think mean, it's fair to say to the extent people pay attention to media policy or communications policy, right? Oh yeah, Iceland has has been doing interesting stuff about speech. I think I think people who generally focus on those okay. areas would say that. Um, that's a regulatory ultimately, you know, solution to a problem that you've described as, as really socio political and even less so socioeconomic. Can law handle that? Right, I'm asking no. you, I'm personally asking you non lawyer. <laughs> One of the most um, unusual things I think about a lot of these uh, projects was again there was this there's this sense of uh, betrayal from the from the official politics from the official uh, halls of power. So a lot of stuff came from the grassroots and tried to bypass that. So these all of these projects, the National Assembly, um, government was welcome to participate, but were really seen as uh, uh, they didn't want to bring them in as partners so much. So that I think there's there's really less of a focus on on legal uh, and even policy based changes. Like they they really just wanted to kind of do things without without government in a lot of ways. So for example, the uh, first National Assembly uh, in 2009 that established the the set of ideals or whatever was really. Uh, really popular. I mean, the, the, the mass media really loved it. The Icelandic people really loved it. Uh, it was very, it really took a lot of, um, uh, it was really in the public eye. And so the parliament, and again, this was a new parliament, this is a new parliament of reformers and fresh faces and things, wanted to partner with the ants. So if you remember that headline was the ants of Iceland. The people that did this, they called themselves the ants. Or the anthill, and the reason they did that was because they didn't want to have leaders, right? They didn't want to have like figureheads or anything like that. They said, "We're just a collective. We're doing these things. We're the ants of Iceland," and so the um, uh, the government wanted to partner with them and say, "We'll we'll sponsor you. We'll do this officially. We'll we'll do that." And the ants said no. So the organizers said no. I think because now they've got some champions. I think they've got uh, bigger to Yon's daughter, and they've got these other pirates, and I think. That are they're really closely associated with the the revolution or the reboot or whatever you want to call it. I think there's they're warming to this idea or there's there's more interest in that. Um, but again, it's there's a still a wariness um, about this official engagement. I think I don't know if that answers your question. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if there is an answer to it beyond considering the capacity of law to address broader issues of well, Derek, uh, as you hear milling others yes. outside the room, thank you for joining us there with the law school. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's fun. Um, so next Thursday, we have an unusual speaker for Comtech, uh, but a guest speaker who is not an Elon faculty member. Uh, Danielle Citron teaches at Maryland Law. She is going to be speaking on the main campus, however, uh, we, uh, through uh, the good office of uh, Dean Barnett, uh, or Provost Barnett, uh, will have the benefit of her visiting us at lunch. Uh, Professor Citron is the author of a book which has gotten national and even international attention uh, called uh, A Crime in Cyberspace.